welcome our speakers. So um, I can see um, Sarah on the screen. Um, hi, everybody. Um, and Sarah, were you going to were you going to start off? I'm I'm happy to if that suits uh, Anant and uh, Zahir. I think is also on the yeah. call. Good. So I can see, I can't see Sahir, but I can see um, Anant's on screen. Thanks, Sahir. That's lovely to see you both. Um, right. So I'd like to welcome everybody to, to today's session. We'll be running just for an hour. Um, as you know, this is part of our webinar session to um, focus people on the um, issues that we have in in terms of our reduced uh, presentations and our falling uh, cancer. Um, uh, diagnoses over the last year and a half as a result of COVID. Um, and you've seen those two graphs before. Thanks, Amanda. You might just want to put the graph up um, there again with the yellow hash area, which is just shows us um, graphically the loss in our shortfall of uh, first treatments, which is really significant. Um, OK, so we're if uh, what I'll, I think will be better, I think it, um, Sarah, you start as we've said that you'll do that, and then we'll. Um, I'm going to miss the housekeeping because I think most of us on this call have heard it a thousand times. So uh, let's make this interactive. Pop any questions, queries, comments you have in the chat, and I'll bring you in as um, uh, when I can. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh so do you want me to start? I will thank you, Sarah. Make the attempt of uh, getting my slides up. That's going to be the uh, tricky one. Uh, let's see. Um, and Amanda, you might have a copy of the slides, do you, for, to share? That's easier. Yep, let me know if you want me to share them. I shall make one attempt, and if I fail, then okay. I will uh, give in. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think that's loading. Lovely. Yeah, you can see them. <laughs> you, you can see them. That's more than I can. Right, I can see them there. So um, I, I just thought I'd start with how to optimise two-week weight referrals for lung cancer and pleural disease. And for anyone who doesn't know, I'm a respiratory physician at the Whittington Hospital uh, and um, a clinical lead for lung cancer. Um, so I thought what we were trying to achieve with the two week waits is trying to get early diagnosis of lung cancer because we know that gives better outcomes. We oh, also yeah, want to um, uh, uh, get patients who have a high chance of having lung cancer investigated uh, and treated promptly um, and also to alleviate uh, patient symptoms which aren't always due uh, to lung cancer even when they're uh, in the lung cancer spectrum. And also we're trying to deliver high value care to the UCLA, uh, to, to the NHS uh, for um, uh, uh, patients. So um, I'm sure you all know that the summit study has been running locally and I think uh, the three of us are all great fans. Uh, sorry to see it coming to a close, but hope it provides sufficient data for the national screening body uh, to take this on because we have all seen asymptomatic patients uh, with small to actually quite medium sized uh, cancers having curative treatment when they had no idea that they even had it uh, in their body. Um, there's also obviously previously been a cough and breathlessness campaign trying to get patients to come forward with their symptoms um, and I think that has been successful but um, you guys are probably more aware. I've presumed that you all have risk assessment tools that you use um, uh, whether it's the RAT tool for lung cancer or the, the Q cancer to give you some idea of um, the chance of patients having cancer and the latest NICE guidance were based on a 3%, so quite a low risk of it being cancer uh, for you to refer. I'm not going to talk much about the nodule guidelines. Uh, I don't know if one of my colleagues will, but um, anything uh, that's uh, small, less than eight millimetres, um, needs follow up. But there's a NICE BTS guidance that makes that easy to follow. Uh, so this may be controversial, I don't know, but um, my mantra is do think chest X-ray. And the sort of person uh, that I would think chest X-ray is. So weight loss, I've seen a lot of patients referred straight to GI, they get topped and tailed, and then someone takes the history they were a smoker. There's the chest X-ray and there's a, there's a large lung cancer. So as you're referring them in for those sort of pathways, 
ask about the smoking history and if there's a risk then then please do a chest x-ray on the way in the same with patients presenting with shoulder pain uh, we've had some picked up that way Hemoptysis, I know, is a little bone of contention, but a chest X-ray is helpful uh, to rule out other diagnoses, uh, pneumonia, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, uh, cough um, uh, is, a, is another way of picking up COVID on chest X-ray, but hopefully not at the moment as it's nice low levels, uh, although coming back in some places. Um, but it is helpful to our triage uh, process if there's been a chest X-ray done um, because, as I say, it may exclude other diagnoses or um, uh, confirm that lung cancer is what we're managing. So I thought a few pictures to illustrate that. So this is a lady who presented with shoulder pain uh, and, as you can see here, uh, had a large uh, cancer at the top of her left lung. But normal chest x-rays did not exclude um, uh, uh, lung cancer. So if the shadowing is behind the heart, then the chest x-ray may look reasonably uh, um, normal. Um, uh, so it doesn't absolutely rule it out. Um, but uh, I find that the chest x-ray is a good triage. So in our pathway at the Whittington, we have run a walk-in chest x-ray service, which has been running throughout the pandemic. Happy to receive feedback if that's not your experience, but certainly that's what my imaging department has continued to tell me. Um, if the chest x-ray is picked up as abnormal in the department whilst the patient's there, then we go on to arrange a CT scan, same time or next day in ambulatory care if that suits the patient better. If the patient's already gone, then the abnormal chest x-ray is alerted to our team. Um, that's chest physicians, uh, lung nurse, respiratory admin and the MDT coordinator. Uh, and then we may contact you uh, and ask, us to, uh, ask you to send us a two week wait. The reason we do that is in case the patient's got links with other hospitals that they would prefer for, for any reason, or you think it's not clinically appropriate because of comorbidities that we're not aware of. Um, so we're used to receiving your two-week wait on the ERS system using the Pan London uh, two-week wait uh, referral form. I think it may be a bit confusing. Sometimes you see a, a time and date uh, of a telephone appointment. It's actually a triage service. The patients uh, are not going to be seen on that day, which some of them think. Um, but what we do is we review the information you've sent. Uh, and if they haven't had a CT, then we will request a CT before seeing the patients. Um, uh, because triaging the CT, we can triage whether they do have lung cancer and need to come to the lung cancer clinic or uh, whether there's another service that would be better for them. Um, we also uh, screen all the GP routine referrals and if there's anything suspicious there that we're concerned about, then we can uh, upgrade them onto the two week wait pathway. And if you're not sure um, which service is appropriate, what the chest x-ray report is saying, then you can use our respiratory advice and guidance service uh, and, and we're very happy to provide advice. Uh, it's just very hard if you do that for images done at another hospital because we obviously can't see them. So that's most appropriate when the images are done at the Whittington because then we can see the images, see the report and, and I'll let you know. Um, I, this may be a slightly out of date, but I think the, the form hasn't changed too much, uh, but this is a standard um, uh, lung cancer referral form and just things I wanted to highlight if that's all right. Obviously contact details, especially mobile is really helpful. Um, if the patients have learning disabilities, mental health issues, substance abuse, uh, then in, uh, key worker information. Uh, sometimes once we get hold of the key worker, the key worker gets them into clinic uh, and that's really helpful to have. If you can provide us with a bypass line, very grateful. Uh, I know um, not all surgeries do. Um, and then knowing who the GP was, because obviously our system just comes up with the GP who's attached to the name, but that's not necessarily the person who knows the case uh, and has sent us the referral. Um, note that there's no box for never smoke a passive smoker. Sometimes the box is left empty and we're just left to guess. So um, if it doesn't uh, fit those categories, please do give us uh, that information. Um, occupation can be helpful. And the other big plea is um, if you have got imaging, um, please send us the report and where it was done. We can all transfer images uh, between our sites. Um, so it doesn't matter if it wasn't with us. But if, if you don't tell us, then the first thing is always a telephone back to you saying where was it so that we know where to go and look for it. So that information really helpful. 
And as I say, pulmonary nodules, usually the first step would be a follow-up CT rather than um, a sort of two-week wait approach. Um, uh, as I say, I know it doesn't mention it, but uh, we would all value you doing a chest X-ray. And if they've got hemopsis, you can refer to us as well as the chest X-ray. As long as when we get to triage, we can see an image. Uh, that just really helps us. Uh, and sometimes if patients have uh, bronchiectasis, they can uh, cough up blood. A lot of the time that the hemopsis with a normal chest X-ray, certainly in my experience, we don't find an abnormality. Uh, and in fact, we've stopped doing bronchoscopy, uh, uh, looking for a cause in those situations. And the other top tip is um, I always look and see if they're on an ACE inhibitor, if they've got a chronic cough um, and, and see if that timing fits at all. Um, Sometimes we do just have these tick boxes filled and, and no sort of background as to why the patient came to you. Just really helpful, doesn't have to be an essay, but a short ditty as to why uh, they came to you, what they're worried about um, is really helpful. And just so you know, the performance uh, status is really helpful because it determines treatment. So most of the studies, certainly of systemic treatment, are of patients with naught one, maybe two, but patients with poorer performance status are not usually included in clinical trials. So uh, sometimes quite difficult to assess uh, what treatment is appropriate, if any, apart from palliation. Um, so the BTS guidance that we use contains things called a Brock score and a Herder score that give us what the potential risk of malignancy is. So personal and family history of any cancers uh, does help us with that. Uh, and again, the plea about old imaging details. From the point of view of um, uh, blood tests, uh, if the renal function is impaired, that, that's important for us to know for contrast CT scans. Um, and they do like them to be within the last three months. That's one thing that's been affected by COVID at our hospital is blood tests. So now patients do have to make an appointment. But for the two week wait, we make them up in the old GP um, uh, area, uh, whereas uh, routine and outpatient uh, patients have them in the, the clinic areas. Um, as far as I'm aware, that's working all right, um, but it's just a bit more clunky than it used to be when we had a walk-in service. Um, obviously, medication helpful. If they're on anticoagulation for biopsies, we can plan ahead. This is the national uh, optimal uh, pathway. Uh, and as you can see, uh, one entry point is GP um, nice guidance uh, referring into us. We would then uh, triage at this point or if the patients had a CT through another route, then this would be the other point of triage. And as I say, we do get um, other clinicians at the hospital who've done a CT for some reason, uh, and they come to us. And as I say, routine referrals can come in, but the big point of triage into the lung cancer clinic is post CT. Uh, we would then introduce them to the lung nurse and uh, try and decide if they are uh, potentially curative or not. Uh, and then if they do go down the potentially curative pathway, we have a bundle of tests that we would do. I've highlighted here lung function and biopsy investigations. So certainly uh, lung function and endobronchial ultrasound have been affected by COVID uh, in the sense that they're aerosol generating. And so room changes and ventilation have just reduced our capacity slightly. Um, but um, we're putting mitigating things in place. Um, uh, if they don't have lung cancer, then they are taken off the lung cancer pathway at this point after the CT uh, and go down a different pathway. Um, interesting point, Margaret, about the raised platelets. Is that another trigger for a chest X-ray? Um, if you ha can't find any other cause and they've been a smoker, then that's uh, uh, reasonable. Um, yes. Uh, two week triage. So what we do, the other thing is if people have pleural effusions, so again, uh, helpful to have the chest x-ray to know what's coming. Uh, what we would do is uh, make them appointment to ambulatory care uh, where they can have uh, bloods, see a respiratory um, uh, clinician who will do a pleural ultrasound, tap the effusion, maybe even drain it and then do a CT scan all in one sitting. Um, because we get a much better CT image when the pleural fluid's gone uh, and it means that the patient doesn't have to come uh, too often. Um, once the patients have had a, tri uh, a CT scan, we triage them 
uh, and we will eyeball them before they've even been reported by the radiologists. Uh, if there is an obvious cancer, uh, in, and we've seen it on the chest X-ray, we will make that two-week wait appointment in clinic at the same time as we make the CT. Uh, we won't wait for the CT result. But if we weren't expecting uh, cancer necessarily, but we find it on the CT scan, then immediately they'll be made a two-week wait appointment. If we don't find cancer, um, then we will send uh, the GP the CT result. Uh, we have standard letters, uh, or we move patients into the appropriate pathway for bronchiectasis, or even if uh, we've detected something abnormal uh, in uh, another part of the body, like gastroenterology, hematology. But some patients, it was a worry about something on the x-ray, we find it's nothing to worry about. We will discharge them uh, back to you in, in those circumstances. We won't bring them up to clinic. Um, I thought these would be helpful contact details for anyone uh, referring uh, to the Whittington. Uh, there is a, a, a mobile that goes to admin and they can put you in touch with the um, radiologist. The radiologists are happy to uh, receive CT requests if it's something they've suggested in their referrals. So that's a bit of a canter through, but um, basically evaluate symptoms with risk factors. Uh, red flag, please think chest X-ray in the diagnostic workup. And I say we don't mind a referral uh, um, uh, without the you having seen the, C the chest X-ray report, but helpful for it to be requested and done before we triage. Sometimes the radiologist will say, please give antibiotics and repeat the chest X-ray. Sometimes uh, we find we get people before the repeat chest x-ray is done. I think sometimes that's because antibodies have already been given in, in primary care, but if that could just be um, made very clear. Otherwise, um, it's good for all the practices to have systems to track those results where the chest x-ray is abnormal and you've given treatment. Um, please put in where we can find the pictures uh, and, and the information. And as I say, uh, they'll always have a CT before they see a clinician. I hope that was a sort of outline of uh, where we are and what we're up to. Uh, oh, and I can't um, do a lung cancer talk without mentioning smoking cessation, but hopefully my colleagues might give more info, but uh, we do do that from the beginning. Thank you so very much, Sarah. That was really, really clear and it was um, just kind of set the context for us. So thank you. I think what I'll do is um, try to take some questions at the end and we'll answer it as a panel because you've got three speakers today so it'd be really useful to um, give everyone their opportunity to present first so I think I'll go to Anant now um, and would you like to share your own slides or would you um, like Amanda to do that for you which is easier Anant? Yes I'll, I'll share my own slides thank you. Brilliant thank you. So I, I um, Annette's from the Royal Free, as, as, as you know, and um, a lung clinician. Thanks so much, Annette, for coming and joining us today. Thank you, Thank you very much. So I, I was asked to speak uh, briefly about trying to differentiate lung cancer from COVID symptoms. Um, yeah. And for most patients, I think that it will be relatively clear one way or the other. As Sarah uh, quite rightly said, that in lung cancer, often patients have no symptoms, particularly in early stage disease that many eventually develop, including a persistent cough, more than three weeks is the kind of uh, cutoff that, uh, that the public health campaigns ask you guys to refer to us from. Hemoptysis, in our experience, as Sarah says, often this is pseudo-hemoptysis from the upper respiratory tract. Hemoptysis from uh, an actual active lung cancer these days is a little bit rarer, given that we're seeing fewer squamous cell cancers in central airways because of the makeup and, uh, and the way that people smoke actually peripheral distal lung adenocarcinomas are much more common now and hemoptysis is uh, less, much less common uh, in, in, in the context of lung cancer than it used to be even 10 or 15 years ago. Persistent breathlessness obviously that has a very wide differential as does unexplained fatigue for more than four weeks. Uh, weight loss Sarah's already spoken about and persistent and recurrent infection can be a bit of a tricky one. And there's lots of other lung diseases, COPD and bronchiectasis in particular, uh, coexist with lung cancer. So picking that out uh, from a, a crowded background of symptoms is, is sometimes tricky, but for those patients, please do refer. There's, there should be no barrier to that at all. And then obviously in the context of COVID-19, actually many patients have no symptoms and we pick up a lot of asymptomatic disease uh, while we're doing our routine swabbing these days when we're bringing in patients electively for things. And this may be a change in the natural history of COVID-19 once people have had vaccinations, once new variants come in, 
actually we ought to be on our guard for patients with COVID with no symptoms and having a relatively low threshold to test now that testing capacity is, uh, is adequate. But of course the acute symptoms if patients do have them are cough, uh, breathlessness, fever, myalgia and loss of taste or smell. Um, but there are there will be a group of patients who maybe don't give quite a clear history, maybe have cognitive impairment, mental health issues and, and things are not quite as clear as they could be. If the onset of persistence of that cough is not clear, if the symptoms of fever are not clear, if they've had flu-like symptoms which come and go for more than a, more than a couple of weeks, chest tightness, fatigue for a shorter period of time, and actually no real clear red flag symptoms. Uh, I think the advice uh, speaking to colleagues and friends, both in primary and secondary care, is just get the patient swabbed first. And if it's positive, then obviously do the usual things and get them self-isolate. And obviously if they're sick, then our doors are still always open. Uh, but if it's negative, then obtain a chest X-ray and have a very low threshold for referring them in. And we'll, we'll absolutely do a CT scan on these, these people. Um, and uh, and we won't always get it right first time, but I think that the the central message is please do refer if you've got any any thought to do so. Um, and there are a number of uh, COVID-19 uh, within the context of cancer resources on healthylondon.org, in particular for patients who speak other languages. There's a bit of um, uh, translated information, which is I think quite helpful that my GP friends and relatives have found uh, found quite helpful. So why the big focus on lung cancer? Well, this is amongst uh, men in England and Wales, the second biggest killer of all, and in women, probably about number seven or eight. And so this is a huge number of people that are living and dying with lung cancer each year. And unfortunately, about two thirds are presenting to us with stage three or four disease, where we're making great inroads in treatment and doing better and better for these patients over the course of the last few years but still actually diagnosing them at a much earlier stage is much more preferable. Given that one year survival, five year and 10 year survival are much better in those that we diagnose with earlier stage disease. And our options of doing less invasive things, sub low bar resections, stereotactic radiotherapy, ablating small cancers is much more. Our capacity to do that, our, our techniques for doing so are much better as well now. So identifying these cancers earlier is really, is really key. And as Sarah said, it would be illegal to talk about lung cancer without talking about smoking. Uh, and some of you may have seen headlines like this and the CMO didn't get everything right, I, I suspect, but this is absolutely right. And I think that the data is reasonably clear that smoking probably has killed more people than COVID did last year. And actually it has been for many years and it will continue to do so unless we do something really drastic about this. So in the long term plan, there's measures for acute trust to kind of do more. Uh, in our particular trust, we're making a big, what well, I'm trying to make a big focus on encouraging uh, proper pharmacotherapy to help people stop smoking, as well as referral to the community services that can really help with really effective behavioural support. And our first line medication for these patients ought to be varenicline. Uh, this is relatively cheap uh, and uh, incredibly clinically and cost effective, as is nicotine therapy, and the two can be used uh, together for inpatients in particular. And there's some uh, data from a study called the Eagle study mandated by the regulators published about five years ago now that's showing in a large group of people. So this was a, a study, a randomized control trial of more than 8000 people, about half of whom had stable psychiatric disease, including schizophrenia, delusional disorders, eating disorders, depression, anxiety. And at all uh, stages that were tested and in, across all groups, Veronaclin was by far the, the best performing medication compared to Zyban, compared to nicotine replacement therapy, and definitely compared to placebo. And actually we've shied away from, from prescribing varenicline because of historical concerns, but actually those were borne out not to be true in this big, well-conducted study. And so what we don't often take into account is in, particularly in patients with mental health problems, that actually stopping smoking is a treatment for their mental health. And the evidence for that is very, very clear. And so we, we need to kind of break down those barriers and make sure that any smoker that comes into any of our services gets optimal pharmacotherapy as well as a referral to the local stop smoking service. And so I was mentioned the summit study and this has been uh, in, in all of our views, I think really very successful. And we're, we're quite lucky to have this study running uh, in our region. Uh, I think it's reasonably clear that lung cancer screening is here, is, is, is going to come as the, as the next kind of cancer screening um, arm within the NHS. The question is, how do we deliver that? How do we staff those services? How do we, it's going to be much more about logistics and finance rather than the evidence that actually 
lung cancer screening with low dose CT saves lives. I think the evidence from that is pretty clear already. And uh, hopefully some of it will help embed some of the logistical questions about how often we should be scanning patients and which patients should we be scanning with which criteria. So uh, I'll end there uh, just on a note that actually uh, a focus on smoking really will help prevent future cases of lung cancer because prevention is certainly better than cure. Thanks very much, Annette. Thank you. Um, that's great. So let's um, move now, please, to Zahir. Zahir Manjera from North Mids, also uh, their lung cancer lead and the respiratory consultant. Thanks, Zahir. Hi, I think um, Sarah and Anant have stolen all my thunder, um, but it's good to go last. <laughs> um, I was going to talk about um, specific um, x-ray findings that probably don't need referral to the lung cancer service. But before I say anything else, um, it's really important just to remember the symptoms. If somebody has symptoms suggestive of lung cancer, regardless of what the x-ray shows, you, you, know, you are mandated to refer that patient in and we would strongly support that. So I don't want the following to, to put anyone off from on referring into our service. So um, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to prepare slides, but I will prepare a, a, a one slide summary and, and send it on, on to be distributed. Thank you. But um, what I will first we'll start off by saying is that we get quite a few referrals still for chest x-ray finding, which reports a granuloma. So a granuloma is essentially just a, a scar-like opacity, may, you know, usually in the context of a previous infection, sometimes old TB, for example. It's typically calcified and it's a benign finding and, and, we, and we very rarely, if ever, uh, request a CT scan for a patient who's got a granuloma. So if you see a chest x-ray report mentioning a granuloma, unless they have symptoms suggesting a lung cancer, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't you know, rush to refer that patient in. And, and use the advice and guidance service for, for patients like this. We're happy to look at the x-rays and, and to reassure if, 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 if it's not quite clear whether you should be referring the patient in. And, and, and as Sarah mentioned, you know, targeting the hospital where the chest x-ray was performed. But I know where I work at North Middlesex, um, you know, patients will have had uh, chest x-rays with inhale uh, at the Lincoln Road Clinic, uh, it, all around Hertfordshire. So there's not really one, you know, specific site that patients I receive have their x-ray. So I'm happy to import images as long as I know where to import them from it. But, you know, that saves a huge amount of time. And another common finding that we quite often get as a, as a referral for as, as an abnormal x-ray suggesting cancer is atelectasis. Um, atelectasis is a finding which suggests that some of the airways, usually in the periphery uh, of, of, of the lung, but, but have just collapsed down and, and it could be because of mucus plugging and an intercurrent infection. It's very rarely, if ever, associated with cancer. Yes, every now and again, we might see patients who have you know, a significant area of atelectasis uh, that, that we may consider doing a scan on, but it's usually in the context of their symptoms at the time. And a lot of the time, no further imaging is required or, or perhaps just repeat chest X-ray. Uh, but once again, if, if, if you're not certain as to the relevance of the findings, you know, you can put in an advice to guidance and we'll get back to you. Um, pleural thickening is another interesting one. Um, yes, pleural thickening can relate to a malignancy, but the kind of referrals that we get quite often are, are apical pleural thickening, which... I feel, I feel I don't know what Anna and Sarah think, but sometimes it can be overcalled by the radiographers and radiologists who report, who report the scans. And, and when it's by apical pleural thickening, so on both sides, it's it's very rarely of clinical significance if it's just very minor. But of course, in, sec, in, in primary care, you don't necessarily get to, uh, well, you don't get to see the x-ray. So you can't appreciate what, what it is that the radiologist is saying and whether it is, truly is an overcall or not. Um, uh, we sometimes do get referrals in on a two-week wait pathway, which mentioned fibrosis or, or other institutional changes. In fact, I was just looking at a referral just now, which mentions numerous uh, lung cysts with, with an eosinophilia that, that has been referred in as a two-week wait pathway, uh, on a two-week wait pathway. And whilst I'm not going, you know, th these patients, you know, do deserve early review and uh, early clinic face-to-face uh, uh, -face review, the lung cancer pathway is not necessarily the right place for these reviews to happen because unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on, on, on what uh, angle you're looking at it from, we are very much about ruling out lung cancer and discharging the patient off the lung cancer pathway. That's, that's how our services are set up uh, because by following that mantra, it means we get 
if we get to see the patients with cancer much sooner and get them through the pathway much sooner. So if, if patients like this are sent to us, we, we we may we may say actually it's not the right pathway, or we may see we may see it and actually say look it's not a lung cancer, and and uh, not necessarily send it back to GP, but actually start them on a new pathway, and ultimately the care may have been delayed um, by by starting on a two week wait pathway, uh, depend, depending on on how the local pathways work in each and every hospital. Um, bilateral effusions, it, it's quite rare actually that we get bilateral effusions being referred in, but every now and again we do. And I think if somebody does have bilateral effusions, it, it doesn't mean it's definitely not cancer. Um, but I think you do have to look at the symptoms and, and make sure that we have investigated for the possibility of, of heart failure or other causes of, of bilateral effusions, other types of failure have, have, have been excluded, you know, a, a clinical assessment, a BMP and echo, um, be before resorting to, to sending in as a two-week wait. It's, it's not often that we see patients present with bilateral effusions with cancer. I, in fact, I can't remember any recent cases at all where, where it's been a lung cancer, so certainly with other malignancies. I, I, I sometimes see it, but not so much with lung cancer. And uh, as Sarah mentioned this um, earlier on, but where the report suggests repeat imaging in a specific time frame, it's usually in the context of consolidation, although I sometimes see it in the context of an effusion as well, where the, where the radiographer says um, give treatment and, 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 and repeat the scan um, in, in six weeks' time. Um, you know, do follow that advice unless you know the report hasn't got the context correct. So it may be that this is or this is the you know the second X-ray or you know this is the second X-ray, this is the six-week X-ray. It just happens to be in a different um, hospital, and that's why you're referring it in, you know, which which is absolutely absolutely fine, of course. Um, or, or it may be that there is a red flag symptom that hasn't been registered by by the reporting uh, radiographer or radiologist. Um, and the last thing to talk about is when when you are sent a CT report, usually by secondary care usually by A&E or, or, or by a surgical team, they've done a CT scan for some other reason and they've picked up upon a finding which they think might need investigating. Sometimes they, they will say specifically, please refer on a two week wait pathway. Well, sometimes they just say, you know, see the GP to manage um, as clinically appropriate and, and leave, leave, you know, really leave you hanging dry in terms of what you do. Um, and we do see these referrals. I, I think my advice would be do refer them in on a two week wait pathway if you're not sure and we will then decide what to do with it. We'll review the scans and, and the vast majority of these, we do actually just take off a two week wait pathway quite early on, either because the finding is, is not cancer related or, or, or our thoracic radiologist is happy to call a nodule a, a lymph node, which is a, you know, a benign finding as opposed to a nodule that needs surveillance. Um, uh, but, but occasionally, you know, it is, they, uh, our colleagues do pick up upon findings that do require, you know, active management on the pathway in, in the form, you know, in terms of biopsies, uh, PET CTs, etc. It's truth be told, if A and E or any specialty pick up a pod of finding which could be a lung cancer, they should be directing the referral to us. And I'll, you know, I certainly would support um, support practices feeding that back to to the specialties that that do this. I find it incredibly frustrating when when a referral has come via GP when when, when the imaging has been done in secondary care, and I really do support colleagues in primary primary care who want to actually feed back and say no this is unacceptable you should be making that referral directly it's so easy to refer into but our lung cancer pathways it's usually just an email and, and a short pro forma um, and we really really you know encourage secondary care to take responsibility for the scans that they do that suggest cancer because anything short of that is delaying the patient pathway uh, the, the SIs that I've, that I've dealt with in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, the two SIs in our lung cancer pathway have directly related to delayed um, action on imaging. And in both instances, it was, a, it was another specialty doing a scan and, and sending the, the referral back to the GP to action. And, and there being many, many weeks, if, if actually months passing between the scan and the letter being sent to the GP. So there was no delay at the GP end, it was, it was a delay in the specialty looking at the report and, and sending it on to the GP, which, which was, you know, I stand by this, it was the wrong thing to do, they should have sent it directly to our lung cancer pathway. So I hope that's music to your ears and I'm, I'm saying things that you want to hear, because um, that, that is a big bugbear of mine where secondary care doesn't take responsibility for its own imaging. Um, I'm not going to talk about smoking because um, Anant has covered it. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my bit of the presentation. So I think we're happy to take questions now.
Thank you so very much. That's really good. And I was, I was just putting in the chat, but I'll say it publicly. Um, thanks very much. That really important point about um, other services not at, or, or frequently not acting on abnormal imaging and sending into the correct pathway. But it's something we're trying to continue talking about. But um, we'll what we need to do is um, drag you along to a meeting with your colleagues with ourselves as well. So we'll do that. So yeah. thank you very much. Um, Afsana has got an interesting point in the chat. Um, uh, Afsana, do you want to speak your question or shall I just read it out? Thanks, Claire. No, happy to speak. Hi, I'm Afsana. Um, if you don't know me, I work with Claire also in the Alliance. I'm a cancer GP. Um, so I, I was just really um, interested, again, from a sort of improvement perspective, and I can see that Anand's agreed with me, that actually is this an area that if we're getting these referrals from, from Zahir, your perspective about um, these chest x-rays that are um, reported, why why is it that that GP then feels compelled to do the referral? And is it lack of clarity or is it uncertainty of what the guidance is? One would think that you have um, the tool sets to look at the guidance um, to see what, what it is that needs to be referred in. So I think that there is something about um, data, like what's the volume of these referrals coming via in a chest x-ray that's supposedly inappropriate. So just some, I suppose, food for thought. Um, the overarching theme here is about optimising referrals and how can we do better, particularly in the context of restrained systems that we're all working in. Um, and if this is an opportunity whereby the, the conversation between radiology reporting um, and primary secondary care interface could be improved, then I would say we, we, we should be looking at that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That's really that's really important um, points, Asana. If we look, we we did an audit about eighteen months ago where we looked at a hundred GP referrals, and um, three um, went on converted to a lung cancer diagnosis, which mean meant the other ninety seven were not. But I'm not worried about that, okay? Because if lung cancer was easy to diagnose, then you wouldn't need secondary care. You know, we'd be doing it all in the, in the community. If if X rays were, were were that great, then we wouldn't need CT scans. So I'm not worried about the volume of referrals coming through. And it, it's, I think myself, I think we all just have to be careful in how we talk about referrals and, and not label them as inappropriate. It's, it's more about trying to provide an opportunity for everyone to learn about how things can be done differently in, in the future. And, you know, how do we write our letters in a way that it can, can be a learning opportunity as opposed to a very quick letter that says patient has been discharged from the pathway. Um, and I think, you know, sessions like this are important where, where we can where we can feedback and maybe the next time we have a session like this, we bring back cases of patients who did not have a lung cancer and who, and who might have been you know, managed in a different way. Just just to give examples, just just to give you the confidence of, of the kind of things that may, you know, don't necessarily have to come through a, a lung cancer pathway because it's not easy. You know, that many to many, you know, I've, it's so easy for me to request a CT and I request a CT for all kinds of things that. You know, I, I suspect if I was a, a primary care physician, I wouldn't be requesting a CT. I see all kinds of patients referred in with with chest pains, which which are you know almost certainly musculoskeletal, where cardiac cause has been ruled out, and and I feel compelled just to do a CT just just to close the chapter. You know, which we wouldn't be doing in in primary care. We, we would be managing as much musculoskeletal chest pain, for example. Um, does that make me a uh, a less good doctor? I don't I don't, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question. Am I, uh, I where I'm doubting? Where we're in an environment where at the moment we don't have established lung screening, um, then your your approach is 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 much more valid. When we get to a point where we're having proper screening, which is you know where we need to be yesterday, let alone tomorrow, but we haven't quite got there yet with the politics of it all nationally. Um, uh, then I think that um, as clinicians, as holistic clinicians, then I completely support your your approach to here. Um, if we get to having be, being lucky enough to have an imaging modality that that will give us what we need and won't have a radiation bill to it, then, you know, that's opens up something else in the future, doesn't it? Thank you. Sarah, you've got your hand up. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to come in. I, I absolutely agree. We, we'd rather uh, see people than not. And I say mm. advice and guidance is one thing. So um, I have to say that our radiologists are very good at using our alert system. So, um, yeah, the poor old gastroenterologist and urologist at my place get pinged emails to say, oh, did you know your chest, your patient had an abnormal this, that and the other? And um, here's Dr. Locke's email address sort of thing. <laughs> so uh, we do try and put them in touch. And the okay. only thing I, I would uh, say there, I absolutely encourage that, that we take them. We, we don't go. But we do sometimes contact the GPs for yep. information is because um, the urologists, etc., 
give us a little potted history, but doesn't necessarily have the things that we want. So we want your, you know, uh, full on uh, past history and, and, and all the data that you have. Uh, yeah. um, so that's why we come to the GPs in those circumstances, which sometimes um, uh, uh, causes questions. But um, it's just to get the richness of the information that primary care hold on those people. Well, I'm sorry it causes questions and you must just come to us whenever you whenever you need it. And I'll repeat that the next time we're doing a lot, uh, a larger webinar. So everybody hears that. Thank you. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions that um, people have been reflecting. So one question is around um, secondary smoking, secondhand smoking. Have, has any, have either of the three of you got any data on the risk if you grow up in a smoking household? And um, are there numbers that we can easily remember? Or is it all vague and vague, depending on the study? Yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants to answer this. I'll, I'll have first go. Uh, the data is really variable uh, in different populations and in different generations. So these days, parents of children growing up in a household will go out to smoke and won't often smoke in front of their kids or that nearby them. Uh, but in years gone by, you know, I worked in a snooker club. I worked in a new, I worked in a news station. I was selling cigarettes to people. Uh, and those were smoky environments where, uh, so, you know, the passive smoking uh, exposure is re incredibly difficult to quantify and actually will just change over time. And the natural history of these things will change over time as well. Essentially, any secondary um, exposure is a risk factor. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sarah, is it here? Do you want anything to add? Oh, you've got something to add, Sarah. Yeah. So, and and the only thing to add, and and I don't mean to sort of uh, uh, throw everything we've said out of the window, but we also do see people who haven't smoked, of course, uh, with lung cancer. Uh, so I've I've recently had a very distraught woman who couldn't quite believe it. You know, presented with with neck nodes. Um, so uh, obviously it's the big risk factor, um, but we just do need to be aware that um, non-smokers, especially uh, in the older population, yeah, can. Yeah, thank you. And you popped your hand up again. And I just wanted to expand on that a bit as well, that the uh, prevalence of never smoking lung cancer is going up and up year on year, particularly in younger populations and particularly in women. And these tend to be adenocarcinomas. And there may be some genetic predisposition in places there may be ethnic variation in these in some of these but we, we think that they're certainly a, a big role to play in terms of air pollution particularly traffic related air pollution yeah. and I think yeah. we all have a role to play as scientifically literate healthcare professionals in reducing not only our own kind of burning of fossil fuels but making sure that other people understand the risks as well and it's not just lung cancer it's heart disease yeah. stroke heart disease as well I think things. yes I, I actually, um, many of you will know Amit Bakai from the Royal Free, and he was telling me that um, them, they obviously, that he's interested in monitoring pollution in London and looking at the data around that. And um, you can see already a drop in, I think, in 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 some of the cardiology and uh, areas just just since our our reasonably recent changes in who we allowed or what we allowed to drive freely or to move through through the center of london and um, but what was really interesting i think really pertinent for the for the north mid and uh, well perhaps i think for all of us that i hadn't quite realized so he said what was really concerning is the increase in pollution just outside the um the zone so that so if you think about that it's the sort of houses close to the north circular and beyond where actually there that it's now possible statistically to see deterioration in cardiorespiratory pathology just related to the change in pollution which is really salutary but also what's quite interesting it doesn't take long to change things if you have absolute we don't always want to do draconian things but um, uh, WHO published some satellite images not so long ago of Wuhan and pollution over their period through through COVID, and it didn't. It took. It was amazingly short from from sort of November to some December through to end of January. You got a massive change in the uh, persistent improvement in um, pollution just because they'd um, uh, stopped people moving around. In, in vehicles that require fossil fuels. So that was really interesting. Um, other questions? Um, uh, uh, um, yes, uh, Margaret saying she had a, non, uh, a lifelong non-smoker presenting with bone mets. Um, I wanted to ask, you've talked about increased risk in women, you mentioned um, possibly genetics. Is there an age 
profile as well or and and in that group is it i recently had a healthcare professional in her mid 30s with a never smoker lung cancer uh, so was she was in of... central london or a you know lived in a yeah, she, grew up, farm she grew up in a reasonably polluted part of town no 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 strong passive smoking history to speak of no genetic abnormalities in the in the cancer itself to suggest that there was a single driving mutation uh does any of the know, data that you've seen the, show that the exposure when you're young is more important yeah more that's important? that's very that's very difficult to quantify uh because exposure through the years is is, is really difficult to quantify certainly in, 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 in any level of detail but essentially the younger the younger DNA mutations happen, the, sorry, the younger uh, an individual is when DNA mutations happen, the better they'll be repaired generally. Uh, so usually exposures through your teens, 20s and 30s onwards is the basic science of it, is that that's when mutagenesis uh, is a bit more persistent. Right, okay, thank you. Thanks. Can I just the, come in the, on the this other thing. Please, are here, yeah. I'll let Alan finish his question. I'm just going to say the other the other thing to bear in mind that doesn't mean that kids are not at risk and it do, doesn't give them other problems. It certainly does. Stunts their lungs, stunts their musculoskeletal growth. And of course, traffic related air pollution comes out at the, about the height of a toddler or the height of a pram at the roadside. And so, you know, we just have to do everything we can to stop that at source uh, and change to a completely zero emission uh, transport system, amongst other measures as well. Thank you. So here, yeah, you know, just to mention is is how how do we manage patients who present to us who are who are younger, let's say who are under forty, who you know where the usual rules don't not necessarily apply and fit, and, and and they have symptoms, and and it really is a tricky area when you have a you know a thirty something year old who's got chest symptoms, and and you're wondering should we refer them in or or or, or get an X ray first and it's really tricky. I think it's it's really difficult, and I, and I hope that you know reassuring to hear that that you won't always get it right. Um, but I think it's just having the awareness that cancers do happen in younger people and getting X-rays early on. Um, you know, I just remember when I was a registrar working with Dr. Locke at Whittington Hospital, and we we had a 35-year-old who was diagnosed with, with with a lung cancer, and it would always live in my mind because he went to ED, I think, on three separate occasions. And never had a chest x-ray once and he had lower chest wall pain and and the diagnosis ed made at the time was um i think it was cholecystitis or, or something gallstone related and and it sounded reasonable at the time because you know he did have slightly deranged lfts but it just lives with me that you know had an x-ray been requested earlier on would, would it have changed his outcome it, it probably would have because at the time he presented he was much much sicker and and the options were were, were less but either way, he would have presented with stage four cancer at, at, at either way because you know, he presented with a large effusion. And, and so it really it really is difficult. This is a difficult age group. So at the very least, I think a low threshold for chest x-rays when, when, when you're not sure it is advice. And yet yeah, send, send them in to us. We're, you know, we, we are not so bold that we're going to discharge his patients when somebody has asked the question, is it cancer? We probably will see them as, you know, if, 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 uh, if, if it sounds reasonable. And that is the best way of, of ruling out a cancer into CT. What do you think about uh, direct access C, uh, CTs and general practice? They've done pilots of this at Homerton Hospital, and I, and I remember, yeah. and I remember the feedback from the from the lead radiographer there was that it was probably underutilized, if anything. That that was the feedback, um, and I don't know if that reflects that that general practice like to have somebody else managing that part of the pathway, perhaps. I don't know if that's one conclusion to draw from it. Um, I don't think I'd have a problem with it, given that we give, we let radiographers in my trust request CT scans if they see a, a, a small nodule and they're not sure, you know, there's a direct CT access for radiographers. Um, but I think it's all about, I think it's all about building a pathway where everybody feels secure. I, I, th I, think, I think that's the key and I, and I don't think any, I mean, Anna and Sarah, are you aware of any examples anywhere outside of our area where, where this kind of approach works? I, I'm, I can't think of any other than the Homerton path, the pilot that happened, which you know wasn't often often utilised by, by primary care, was the feedback I received. Um, I think Sarah and then Anand. 
Um, so uh, I'm happy for the uh, GPs to request CT scans, especially if the radiologist has suggested it. Um, the only, uh, and in fact, I've had one patient recently with weight loss who had a neighbour who was a gastroenterologist who, who who passed on the message suggested GP orders a CT, um, and in fact um, uh, that did pick up uh, two lesions. Um, so it, you know, it can be very helpful. The only thing I would say, if you've got a, a, a chest X-ray that suggests a lung cancer, it's actually slower for you to request the CT than for you to send the two-week wait and me to request the CT. Yes. So, and the other thing is that um, often um, the request just says CT uh, and a non-contrast scan gets done. And for lung cancer, you need a contrast scan so you can see the lymph nodes, etc. So. I've, I've absolutely no uh, worries about a GP's requesting, and I'm sure that the radiologist would would scream for the, the sense of it sort of thing. Uh, but they're just a, um, in some instances, it's actually quicker to, or better to send the two week wait referral. Thank you. Thanks. Ag Alex. Agree with. Yeah, agree with Sarah's points. I would love for GPs to have uh, direct access to CT if it was quicker. I think at the moment it's, it probably wouldn't be um, and that the our radiologists at the moment want to see firm data from from other places there is some data from liverpool for example where uh, again as zahir says probably it was a bit underused rather than anything uh, and ct scanners were not completely overwhelmed with gp requests for cts um you know uh, so i think hopefully over time data will emerge and systems will change but uh, at the moment our guys are not particularly keen on that i i am but um it's a bit of a work in progress at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, clearly, I think protocols for doing it would be um, uh, would be essential. We know from data when we have done that across, um, we've, we've done we London wide, cancer wide. We've looked at sort of behaviours around that, and in fact, in, in general, GPs are prudent with their use um, and don't run amok and and image everybody, which is often what you hear as a fear from secondary care. Um, one of the things that I think we sometimes forget and patients completely forget about CT scans is that they do, if you speak to a haematologist, they'll tell you that they can give you the lymphoma risk for every every CT scan at every age group. And um, that's really important. It is important to remember because um, uh, uh, lots of people manage to get masses of scans for, of all sorts of bits of their body. So and then don't quite realise that actually the problem, the greatest problem is that they, they mustn't they mustn't go and badger the GP for a further referral to that's going to deliver another scan, that which is again going to be normal. So I think that um, I think that we have to be aware of that as well. And sometimes it's a um, we're not or we're not aware about the cumulative that, that it's some unless you have um, unless you're looking for it, it's easier to miss accumulation of scan. And it may be that that's what we that what we kind of need to look at as well. Any other questions? Um, we've got some interesting stuff being continued to be posted um, in the um, chat. Um, what about uh, someone's brought up um, bronchiectasis um, and not showing on 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 chest X-ray, um, which has been accepted? Margaret, do you want to speak your question? You're talking that might be easier. It's not really a question, but I wasn't aware that other places didn't accept CT scan requests directly from GPs because we. Oh, I see. Them, yeah, we've yeah. been doing them for years. Yeah. So and, I. I you know, my experience, yeah, if I just cut you short, Mark, because we're short of time, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. It is true that if you have enough of a dialogue with your um, radiology department, even in my own experience, I've been able to get scans, but usually I've had to follow it up with a phone call to somebody senior that I know in the department. Um, and that sometimes is difficult for, bi for, for, for busy GPs. Whereas the Whittington just does it. Right. We shall get them all on the northern line, two stops, three stops down from Middle Barnet down to um, uh, Archway. That, Thank you. That might yeah. sink our service. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, we've we're just we've got a few minutes before we end. I mean, I I I really enjoyed the session today, and I think lots of people have had some really you know really thought provoking stuff. So, um, but I just if are there some last messages the three of you would like to share? Um, can I can I say uh, something? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think what would be uh, I don't know if anyone's mentioned it. Sorry if they have. I think it's just to remind everyone it's important 
to signpost the patients on the journey that you're about to set them on. Um, so I think it's reasonable to tell patients that the first visit in secondary care may be in the CT scanner before they meet um, a healthcare professional. And it's very possible that the results um, of the scan will be um, fed back to them either by telephone or by letter, depending on which service you're referring into. And if you're not clear wh what, you know, how, how the process works for your um, for the hospital you're referring into, then just give one of us an email and we're more than happy to share our specific pathways for, for, with you. As, as we've got the three of you here, just quickly, a minute each, could you, do you want to say that? To, uh, just to uh, sort of speak that. So North Middlesex is straight to CT. So that's your, that's your first visit, unless yeah. there is a specific reason we want to meet the patient first. And that's usually for somebody who is young and we are umming and ahhing about whether we want to do a CT. And by young, I'm talking about somebody, you know, who's, who's you know, in their 20s, maybe very early 30s, um, for example. Um, the CT can is supposed to take between, you know, three to five days, although recently it's, it's the time to CT has been taking up to 10 days. And I'm trying to understand the reasons for that. I've been told it's because there's been a lot of CT colon colonograms requested by our rapid diagnostic um, service that we set up for weight loss and, that, and that's impacted our ability to get CT chest quicker but we're looking into that but typically it will take you know anything between three to five working days to get a CT scan thereafter the report takes a few more days um, you know anything up to three to four days but you should accept expect a phone call within within 10 days of, of your CT scan and who is going to phone um, so here who will phone so at North Middlesex it's a consultant that will phone and very you know, very seldomly a registrar. That, that's the pathway at the moment, but we're probably yeah. going to refine that. If we cannot get through to the person at the first attempt of phone call, then we will send a letter out there and then to reassure them. Um, right. These are for normal CTs. And for an abnormal CT, we will request a face-to-face -face review with the patient yeah. um, in, a, in a very timely way. Um, but I know that our colleagues send letters and we are looking into that. It's, it's a... It's a philosophical debate we're having locally, where uh, one voice is very strong that we should be speaking to them on the phone, ready to answer their questions, whilst whilst others are are very comfortable sending out letters. And we haven't quite reached the end of that debate yet locally. I, I think patients mostly want information, whatever way it comes. But I would say that uh, a call from the specialist um, is really valued by patients, and they regard it allows them to regard the experience of going in for image rather like their outpatient review and that's very important yeah. so um i don't know who that voice is but they've i think they're probably right you know it's about allowing the system to do that and we're clinicians aren't we we join medicine to speak to patients so we probably need to sit down sit the um, managers down in a room and talk to them about that a bit it's, it's, uh, that's it's certainly that's certainly how I'd like to do it at the Whittington. At the moment, I don't have the resource. So we do send standard letters out, which just reassure patients. But uh, I try and ring those that I can. But at the minute, I don't have the resource. Right. Uh, Thank you, Sarah. Available. But it might be, that's, that might be a dialogue across our whole system. Anna, were you going to, who who does your, do you, phoning, if, if you know, how do you manage that? Like, like Sarah, we would be uh, over, we don't have the resource to call all no. patients. So in order to encourage more patients to be referred, we have to take uh, the action of sending sure. template letters to patients yeah. at the moment. I think the last couple of messages that I'd like to give is, particularly with COVID, keep an open mind. Don't kind of assume things about symptoms. Keep the referrals coming in. And if in doubt, then please refer. Please prescribe Varenicline for any active smokers and stop buying and burning fossil fuels. Thank you. <laughs> that I'm, I'm going to end there. I think that's fantastic um, uh, summing up. Uh, phrase uh, and um, thank you a very very big thank you to all three of you and we'll look um, as Ia suggested it we'll look at doing a follow-up um, session in time where we look at maybe some cases so perhaps um, uh, and, and bring the three of you together again would be fantastic thank you very very much and thanks also to the um, uh, Cancer Alliance team for putting this all together and supporting us um, and see you all soon thank you bye-bye bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thanks everyone thank bye -bye. You. Thank you.